Paul. So I'd like to take a few minutes and talk to you a bit about uh, how we can use INSAR methods to better manage our groundwater resources. And I'm going to go very quickly through some uh, quick discussion of the physics of the problem and then talk about how we deal with specific things that have been problems with doing these kinds of studies previously uh, using INSAR. So, um, we all know that water is a critical resource. The important thing is that as we develop more and more of the world, we're using up all the easy to get surface water and we have to rely more and more on groundwater. And groundwater is much more hard to assess and manage because it's underground. It's not like a lake that you can just go out and look at the level for. And so we have to go to various other kinds of methods for looking at these. INSAR turns out to be a really nice tool to help us do some of that work. Wrong button, sorry. Um, so groundwater reservoirs are part of the overall uh, ground, uh, freshwater system on the Earth. Uh, they're often very, very poorly characterized, mainly because there is not very much uh, data available. And existing to that, almost everywhere on the Earth there are groundwater reservoirs, and so you really have to have the point of view of a s orbiting uh, satellite in order to be able to see and uh, assess these things on the whole worldwide uh, distribution and basis. And INSAR is going to turn out to be a way to help us do that. So today we're going to talk quickly about the role of groundwater in the water cycle, how INSAR measurements of deformation help us characterize the constrained aquifer. Uh, we're going to give you uh, an example from some data in central California in the Tulare Basin and show how we deal with a problem called uh, temporal decorrelation that is what typically limits the application of this kind of a technique to an agricultural area as we usually have in uh, groundwater areas. So without going into too many of the details, uh, a water balance model is simply going and identifying all the various sources, sinks, and storage places for water in a given system. And uh, if you look at a scale of what we call a basin, typically tens to hundreds of kilometers in size, there'll be water on the surface that we can see. There's water at the surface and just under the surface, which is part of what we call an unconfined aquifer because there's no top to it. Soil moisture comes into this as well as the plentiful number of uh, shallow wells that are, are, um, are drilled in the area to exploit it. And then often that there's a layer of, the, of more impermeable material underneath. We call this confining layer, and below that sits the unconfined aquifer. And the unconfined aquifer is the hardest of these because it's the deepest to be able to understand, but it happens to be the one that INSAR uh, responds to. So if you look at that balance equation on the bottom, uh, you can see that there's one term that uh, is the one that we're going to be concentrating on here. So how do we model groundwater flow with INSAR? Well, we know that um, uh, through pore elasticity models, we can relate stress to pore pressure. Uh, essentially, if you change the amount of water, you change the effective stress. When the effective stress gets high, it deforms the sediments. And so we get an indirect, although a pretty good measurement of how the, head, uh, the hydraulic head, which is the level of the water in the system, is changing uh, simply by measuring the deformation. And so you can go through some math. I don't want to spend the time going through this uh, here, but basically we get something called a storage coefficient, which we either get per unit depth or integrated over the aquifer system that says how much water you can store uh, column-wise in a given part of an aquifer. Then if you know the area on the aquifer, you can figure out the amount of water going in and out of the system. So this little cartoon shows you how we can look at the change in head by looking at deformation. On the left is a well. It's got a high level. We pump it down a little bit, and that causes a corresponding decrease in the height, which is the little delta B in the upper right that you see there. That is a small term. It's on the order of centimeters, but it's perfect for measuring with INSAR because we have that kind of sensitivity. So there has been some work done uh, over the past, oh, decade or so showing that changes in head, which are the, um, the red dots that you see here, and when I say head, I mean hydraulic uh, water level, uh, those track very, very closely with estimates of 
the deformation that we get from INSAR. So the blue dots are the, are the INSAR, the red is from the well data, we only have that on the last couple of years, but you can see that they agree quite well, and so we would do a pretty good job extrapolating water levels uh, back in time if we go back and look at the historical um, INSAR deformation time series. And once we know these things, then we can begin to model the groundwater flow. So here's a very simple one-dimensional calculation uh, for horizontal flow within an aquifer. And without getting into too much of the detail, there are a couple of, of important terms in here. There's this dH dt, which is the change in the hydraulic head versus time, and a dH dx, which is the change in hydraulic head versus position. So if the head is equal to the deformation, all we have to do is be able to, deform to measure deformation versus space and time. That's what we get out of a series of INSAR measurements. And so it's perfect for allowing us to solve this kind of differential equation and understand the water flow. So how would we use this to manage an aquifer? Uh, there are a couple of terms in that previous equation. One is called the conductivity, one is called the storage. And essentially, if that are, those are known everywhere, then we can derive how the head will change if we know the amount of rainfall and other kinds of surface water and other uh, kinds of discharge over time. So the approach for doing this is that we would take and develop an INSAR time series of subsidence in an area. We would look at historical values of hydraulic head and the forcing, which is this um, sources of water and, um, and sinks of water to estimate these values of KNS everywhere. And then we can predict future um, values of the hydraulic head from things like climate forecasts and other uh, weather uh, prediction that tells us what's going in and out of the system. And that gives us a handle on how we can manage that water. So what happens when we try to do this in practice? Well, here's an example from a region in the Central Valley, uh, just south of the city of uh, Fresno, California. It's this region down in here. It's called the, this area that uh, I want to concentrate on is called the Tulare Basin. A schematic picture of that is shown over here, and this dark thing running through it is a clay layer. It's called the Corcoran clay, and that is this impermeable layer that prevents water from going through it. So above that, we have the unconfined aquifer, and below that, we have the confined aquifer. So what we're going to look at is changes in the confined aquifer as expressed in the um, uh, deformation time series. So the problem that we have is, if you look at this, uh, at the Tulare Basin in particular, we see that there is no color, i.e. no good phase measurement in a large part of this. And the reason is that the phases are very, very random in this area because of this phenomenon of temporal decorrelation. It's essentially due to the presence of crops, agriculture, plants that change. So we have to have a way of dealing with that. And so there are a couple different ways to deal with it. Uh, there's a lot of this temporal decorrelation everywhere, so we either need to find the pixels that don't decorrelate, and this is a method called persistent scatterers, and this is a pretty good way for finding some good points even in the, if the general area decorrelates a lot. And the other thing is that even though it decorrelates a lot, if you take enough looks, average enough measurements together, you can in fact get a pretty good phase measurement uh, uh, in either case. Both measurements work, there's advantages to both, and we can talk about those at another time. So here's a detail of that decorrelated Tulare Lake area. And if you look at the area here where we have the decorrelation, you get a lot of noisy pixels. But if you look carefully, say, along these roads, you'll see that you get these nice uniform bits of color, which means that the phase measurements along those roads are really quite stable. So if we could identify all those points to begin with, we can throw out the noisy ones, interpolate in between, and still pretty well co um, uh, constrain the subsidence that we have in the area, because the subsidence tends to be on a larger scale than the fields that you see here. So we can identify those persistence uh, pixels. Um, this is just an approximate algorithm. Depending on where you set a threshold, you can either have more of those persistent pixels with a few extra errors or fewer of those with, uh, with, more error, with uh, fewer errors. But you can see that it does preserve all the points along the roads here, which provide a network we can interpolate in between to get the, uh, this good phase measurement. <coughs> 
And if you compare a map of the phase derived with and without uh, using those persistent, those persistent pixels on the left is just averaging the raw measurement and then um, applying a spatial filter to smooth out some of the, the noise on that. It works pretty well in most areas, but that temp but in the look in the decorrelated area, you see all kinds of uh, spurious signals that aren't real. But if you look on the right, where we've interpolated between and smoothed it to the same level, it's a nice smooth map and we can get a very, very nice result that way. Uh, the other approach is to simply take a lot of looks. So we happen to have a lot of measurements from this area here. This, there is uh, 120 interferograms, and then we took a bunch of looks spatially as well. In fact, there's over 60,000 per pixel in this image. Um, but you notice if you look at the interferogram on the right, despite the fact that the correlation is low, we still get a pretty good phase estimate. So if you can have a long time series that's highly oversampled, much faster than the time uh, sampling would tell you you have to have, um, you can average those together and get rid of a lot of these noises. So if we can run this quick movie, it should run for about uh, five seconds. If, wake up. Hello. And if we can't, just to be ready, I made a picture here of every tenth scene because <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. And you can see that the deformation is increasing nicely over time. And in fact, uh, it, 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 at this scale, you can't see the difference between the annual and the long-term uh, deformation, but we can plot those. And that's actually important for the water problem because the long-term deformation is typically what we call inelastic, and it means if you have more stress put on the aquifer than the preconsolidation stress, the historical stress, it typically will compress enough that you can't ever uh, get that uh, volume of water storage back. So you don't want to operate where you have that going on. If you look here, you can see from the green dots that there happens to be inelastic deformation in this area on top of the annual signal that you see nicely in the red dots. So this particular area in the Tillery Basin is being overpumped. They're messing up the aquifer right now and are going to lose storage uh, because of that. So in summary, INSAR is a new tool that lets us manage water availability and uh, sustainability by looking at deformation of these aquifer parameters. Once we have those parameters, we can run all kinds of use scenarios and things through the models and figure out a good way to uh, not overpump these and do the kinds of damage that are being, being done in the Tulare area. And uh, this is made possible by INSAR, even in the agricultural areas, once we can deal with the temporal decorrelation problem. So with that, I'll pause. Thank you very much for your attention. What? I'm sure they'll be so. There's good. actually two minutes for questions. <laughs> hey, there's and there's a question. Please come up and use the microphone or ask somebody to. Yeah. Go back two um, I hate to say this. Go back two slides, please. This, this doesn't have a. They can do it. Oh, they can do it. Okay. Which? Can you go uh, back to the presentation and go back two slides? No. Can you? <laughs> uh, there we go. On this, are you trying to find, asking for how much? Yeah, one more. One more back? One more back. Okay. Oh, yeah, the bottom. Yeah, that's uh, the maximum there is 75 centimeters. Yeah. It is. And if you look at back over history, there is, uh, there is tens of feet. In the, in this century or the last century in this area. Lots. <laughs> it's a problem. <laughs> so for those uh, watching uh, remotely, the question is, isn't that a lot of deformation? And the answer is yes. <laughs> Um, so the question is whether or not there are some cases where the head increases and we still see subsidence. The answer is actually yes. 
Um, uh, that, uh, but basically it has to do with uh, specifics of that particular aquifer. There can be, very, there can be time delayed things because there is time constants associated with the flow of the water and so it takes a while to catch up to that. Also in areas where the conductivity or not the, where the storage is, uh, coefficient is very, very low to begin with, then uh, the signal itself is very small and very noisy and so it's hard to distinguish those as well. This happened to be a, a very large signal and easy to see. Okay. <laughs>